I'm Dr. Pete Economo, the East Coast psychologist. And I'm Dr. Nikki Rubin, the West Coast psychologist. And this is When East Meets West. So Pete, today we're going to, you know, talk about grief, um, which is, you know, we do a lot of sometimes lighter episodes and uh, fun episodes, uh, but we also want to make space on this podcast to talk about some of the more difficult things. And given, you know, uh, the recent uh, death toll in the United States from COVID, right, past 500,000 lives lost this year already, you know, we really thought it was appropriate to, uh, to start this conversation. So hi, Pete. Hey, yeah, because, well, there's no one that has not experienced grief. Mm -hmm. I mean, no, I I guess maybe if you're like a kid or something. Well, I was going to say, maybe there's some people that haven't experienced it yet, Yeah. though there isn't a human walking this earth. And actually, you know, I'll say animals as well. Animals also grieve. Um, There's no, there's no, I love those videos. We we do, we do. And um, there's no, there aren't any, you know, um, animals, living beings, humans that won't experience it, maybe is the best way to say it. Yeah, because it's, it's just a common experience to life. And so, yeah, it's, it's uh, the suffering that we all experience. But yeah, so not a, not the funnest topic, but certainly yeah. uh, a, a common experience is something that we all have. And while we are focusing on behaviorism that, and we don't want to focus entirely on like world issues or the or the pandemic in particular, mm-hmm. it's, it's clearly with over 500 dollars just in the U.S., just in the U.S. alone, right. yeah. So for our listeners abroad, uh, you know, thinking that they're, it, it, the, the toll across the, uh, the, the globe is, is much higher. And so that this is maybe for some people to face grief in a different yes. kind of way. You know, the other thing about this that hopefully we'll get to is that we've all, we're grieving in a much different way in, d- during the pandemic, too. Yeah, well, because we're all, you know, there's a lot of similar experiences that we're having. And of course, mm-hmm. like the degree of grief that uh, someone's uh, experiencing in, in this particular context is going to vary. Uh, but but maybe we could start by defining grief here, because I think, you know, sometimes there's a bit of confusion around like, what is grief, for example, versus depression? Or what is grief versus sadness? Because they're, they're obviously all, you know, kind of cousins of one another, and they're different emotions. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I guess I would ask uh, you. Well, I know you like my definitions. I do. So I was going to ask. I'll give you a Merriam Webster if you want one. Okay, please. Let's do it. Deep yeah. and poignant distress caused by or as if by bereavement. Okay. So, you know, grief that's, that's is, a lot of like it's, wordiness. It's a lot of words. <laughs> and, and, yeah, I like, I like, I like words. But that's a lot. That's a lot of wordiness. Deep sorrow, yeah. especially that's caused by someone's death. Yes, though it could be, you know, I think it's important to say like we can also experience grief in response yeah. to a breakup. Right. That's right. You loss. Know, loss. It's really, it's, it's immense loss. Immense loss. You know? Deep sorrow may be caused mm-hmm. by loss. Yeah. That would be our definition. Yeah. That's what I would say. And I, and I would also say it's, um, and it's something I talk about in therapy a lot. I'll say, you know, the distinction with like sadness and depression, right. Is that, so depression is, um, is it's, I don't know better way to say it. It's like it's clinical. Like there's a yeah. heaviness. There's like a lethargy. There's sometimes we actually don't feel sad when we feel depressed, right? That's we right, can feel yeah. like numb or flat. We'll um, say more about that because some listeners going to be confused by that. Yeah, and and we, you know, Pete and I've already discussed. We definitely need to do an episode specifically on depression. But depression is, it's it's you can feel sad when you're depressed, though. It's I always say it's like it's very. Um, grief is physical too, but depression is very physical. Like you'll, yeah. you know, you don't want to, you're not motivated. Um, your sleep is impacted. There is a, uh, like a flatness that comes along with it. There's a disconnection yeah. to, um, to living, right? Like you don't get joy or pleasure, um, out of things that you usually have interest in. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and that then anhedonia, sad- that, that, yeah. big, that, that word that like, yeah, say, say that word for folks. Cause they're anhedonia, not already- that five yeah. cent word that we call like in psychology that I never knew before I got to psychology. Maybe did you as a literature major know that word? I did not actually. Okay, well, I, did not. <laughs> I did not. I did not. Well, when we teach students, it's just any a in front. That's like, I guess just from uh, Latin it just mm-hmm. means that it's removed. So like a right. motivation or anhedonia. So anhedonia is a loss of pleasure in mm-hmm. In activities that you do would otherwise feel pleasure, a motivation is a lack of motivation. Yes. All parts of the depression makeup, yeah. Yes. Well, and just before you keep going, like the DSM, yeah. I think one of the things that we also try to highlight and that I say is is that depression uh, is it's a symptom, you know, and yeah. and you know it's not always 
it's not really, it's not the diagnosis. And because there's so much that goes into the experience of depression. So we have like major depression, mm -hmm. major depressive disorder, uh, you know, depressive disorder, things like that. But the act of depression. And I think this is the thing about behaviorism is that we all experience these symptoms differently. Yeah, the, the, absolutely. There's going to be common threads and then there's going to be different manifestations exactly. of, 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 um, of symptoms and emotional expression. Absolutely. And then I think lastly, it's important, lastly, it's important to distinguish between sadness, which is sadness is mm. the most common emotion, right? Like we can feel sadness for all kinds of reasons. Um, and I, you know, I often get asked the question uh, by patients like, why would evolution select for sadness? Because we talk a lot about like hmm. evolution selecting for other reasons. I say, well, because if we couldn't feel sad about anything and this yeah. is a tie into grief, uh, that would mean no nothing means anything to us. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. the potential to lose something, to not get what you want to be disappointed. And that could be like a job, a relationship, you know, I don't know, just something that you imagine was going to turn out a certain way. If you had no potential to feel sad about that, that means yeah. you don't care about anything. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And would you add anything to any of those definitions or? No, I think it's, uh, they are the universal emotions. I, did you say sadness was the most common? Did you say that or just that? Oh, it was... oh, oh no, I was saying uh, out of, um, between depression and grief, right? So like okay. in these, in these cousins, right, they all kind of exist under a similar umbrella. Sadness is something we feel lots of times, right? It's not, um, but it's, it's like grief is unique, yeah. right? Grief is yeah, gr well, yeah, grief is unique, and that's what we'll get to uh, the stages of, of grief and and how grief is the process of this really like significant loss, uh, basic emotions. Because that's why I thought it was key. Yeah, like, you, you need to feel sadness. Like so, when yes. people come to me and they're like, "Oh, I'm really sad" or "I'm anxious," it's like good, like yeah, because it's a yeah. basic emotion. So I'm glad you're feeling. Yes. Let's just learn how to feel it. So the, the the universal emotions are typically defined, and if anyone's seen Inside Out, you will yeah. recognize the characters. S something I assign for homework many times to, yes, to be able to watch that. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Uh, so disgust, sadness, happiness, fear, anger, or surprise. And so sadness, mm -hmm. it just it's a part of the common experience, and that's a lot of what, another theme in which we we address here on e when East meets West. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, and this is going to be a thread across any emotion is that grief is something we also want to allow ourselves to feel. And That's so right, yeah. grief, you know, I'm always really clear with people that I say grief is in probably one of the most intense baseline emotions that we can experience. Yeah. Right. You know, so other emotions like anxiety or sadness or joy, they can become intense, right? Mm -hmm. When we engage them, they can become dysregulated. Grief, it's just when it shows up, it is extremely intense. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just, and, uh, yeah. There's complex grief, you know, so there's yeah, com com complicated grief. Yeah. And complicated yeah. grief. Yes. Which, which yeah. is like, I would say, um, that's when grief, it, you know, it starts to take on sort of like a, it's related to trauma. Basically yeah. it can take on a more, there's sort of like a different treatment for that. And, you know, yes. maybe we could do another episode about that would probably be, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> another one. Yeah. Probably another one. Cliffhanger. Probably another, yeah. Cliffhanger. So, okay. So, Getting back to grief here, um, you know, and maybe this would be an important time to, I'm sure people are thinking as we're talking like, oh, I've heard of like the five stages of grief, right? Yes. So, you know, hopefully uh, listeners have heard this before. So uh, there was a, a doctor named Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who she's the one that developed the stages of grief in um, her landmark book, which is called On Death and Dying. Mm -hmm. And she um, initially had a theory that there was a linear five-step process to grieving. Mm -hmm. And her the, the stages she outlined were denial, anger, bargaining, mm -hmm. depression, and acceptance. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. And so, you know, a lot of people, sometimes when I'm working with people that are, uh, you know, what? I'm sorry, I didn't realize yeah, that she, I didn't realize that she presented them as linear. I mean, I think, yeah. I, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that, and I think that, and, and that makes sense, right? Because we talk a lot about this on this podcast, right? Like we, we assume as humans that things follow a linear process. I don't know. Right? Nothing. Well, I, well, I, <laughs> well, that's, I got rid of that line. a long time ago. Well, I was going to say, well, that's part of, and that's part of, I think, you know, obviously your, your Zen practice, right? Like, you yeah. know, the, but, but we know how the brain is wired. We make that assumption that things follow in that way. But, you know, again, and let me just, wait, I think we need yeah, to explain that because linear, like, I think for a listener that just to think about even what it means for it to be linear, that meant that Dr. Culver Ross was saying that you would initially feel denial. You would then feel anger. You mm -hmm. would then bargain before feeling depression and then acceptance. So it, it suggested that you followed those, that in a very discreet way. 
Yeah. And, and this is a fact to like beats getting right at the punchline here is like, what we found is obviously nothing is linear that those, yeah. we don't necessarily follow that pattern that I, I say to people, those are all potential aspects of grief. Yeah, You may experience all of them. You may experience some, you may follow that order. It may be a different order. Let me ask you a question, just live us in our preparation yeah. is, so there was research by psychologists that then found that it was not in that linear way that she had originally presented it. That's, this is where I need to recall a little better. I, 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 I read that once. It's like, okay. I read I read that once somewhere and there've been other um, clinicians that have like proposed other theories where yeah. they're basically saying like, it's not, it's not linear. And I think like, you know, anybody listening that has experienced grief in their life and their life would might kind of go, yeah, like I didn't follow that pattern. I know for my own self um, when I've experienced grief, I've experienced some of those aspects, but not all of them. And yes. certainly not in that order. I don't know about, how about for you, Pete? Yeah. I mean, I, I, that's what, the reason I asked that it was not to put us on the spot, uh, yeah, yeah. but also just to realize that like, I feel like I've always taught it as a fluid thing, but I think whenever mm -hmm. I think of any sort of any developmental process within psychology, I have always conceptualized it as fluid. So if, you, if I think of identity development, mm -hmm. any of the constructs that us psychologists have tried to manualize or operationalize i think right. i've always seen them as fluid and i don't know if that's my zen so that's why i was more asking is like i i'm not sure if i've read it was trained that way or if it was just my zen so sometimes hey listeners i get confused <laughs> right we, we, we don't we certainly we certainly don't know i everything. don't know that's, where some of my stuff comes from sometimes yes no it's also sometimes we learn things so long ago um yeah well yeah i think that, that old no <laughs> well i think that partially is your zen i think that is also just actually our training as psychologists that we recognize that um, emotions and again grief is an emotion yes. uh it, again to reiterate the most one of the most intense emotions we can experience at baseline emotions are not linear processes they don't mm -hmm. they don't follow a, a perfect neat pattern right yeah. so Pete, oh, I, gonna, actually you oh, know dr what? uh kubler it was 1969 that, that book was published i didn't realize it was that long ago yeah it's really yeah wow. so that's really helpful to kind of conceptualize even just from that i mean again foresight you know she had some really right. incredible foresight there for sure well, so Pete, I'm wondering, you know, if we can, because I think this is a really important piece um, here, because I, I definitely want to touch a little bit on some spirituality aspects of this, because this can often come up with with grieving and the process. Yeah. Like, how how, how does um, Zen Buddhism conceptualize grief, or how is grief, you know, maybe approached from from that lens? Well, I think what we would actually just focus on loss and non-attachment. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't, I don't know. So this would be interesting for a scholar, really. Like, I wonder if in Sanskrit or some of these traditional languages, if there's, if there's a translation of grief. And my guess and my assumption is that there might not be. Interesting. Because spiritually speaking, there is not a grieving process per se, because the practice is about non-attachment where like, so loss is meant to be a peaceful transition to your next life. That's very interesting. And I, well, no, I'm really, that's that, well, and I think this is what sometimes can get confusing for yeah. um, those that are new to the concept of non-attachment, yeah. because I think sometimes that can be interpreted as not feeling. Yeah, no, it's not, it's, it's, it's actually more of an acceptance of the sadness and, 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 and let's call it grief, right? For, the, yeah, grief, for, yes. for this, because yeah. it is universal. So they'll embrace that you're feeling sadness, depression, grief, right? We'll sort of mm -hmm. use it in that way yeah. from the loss. The goal is to really adjust to the new life without that loved one. And you do so in a peaceful transfer, like a peaceful and a calm way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm thinking, and, and I remember like, when I, when I started studying Buddhism and my, uh, an, an aunt of mine had passed and I remember going to the funeral and I was like, Oh, you know, feeling very, uh, celebratory of her life. Like that mm -hmm. was sort of the approach I was taking. And then as like the, the coffin was rolled up and my mom was crying, I was like, Oh shit, I feel crying coming on, you right. know, like, and right. I was like, wait, why am I going to cry? Like, right. right. Well, because you, well, you want, and that was like, you're trying to, you know, thinking of back to our episode on toxic positivity last season, exactly. right? Like that you were attached to this idea of like, I don't want to feel the grief. I just want to, I want to feel good. Right? right. I just want to celebrate her. Well, and there's a, a, one of the stories of the Buddha about this was like, a, and, and this is tough. A woman who lost her child mm -hmm. came to the Buddha and said, you know, begged her, begged the Buddha to bring her, her child back. And the Buddha asked the woman to bring a mustard seed from a house where no one had ever died. 
So, you know, so it's that thing for people to think like, so the Buddha said, bring me back a mustard seed from a house where no one has ever died, you know? And so, um, it's she, not possible. she of course could not find a household. Um, and so that the idea is like the pain of death is, is universal and that's right. the, the universality of dying. Yeah. Well, and I was going to say, it's like, this is, and we've, we've touched on this in previous episodes, you know, Eastern practices are much more skillful at bringing that into our conceptualization of being alive, right? That like part of yeah. being alive is that, you know, again, like impermanence and like we'll all die at some point, right? Like that's that's going to happen. And I think in, from a Western perspective, and, and I'm going to be honest, I yeah. think even in, you know, even in psychology, you know, even from cognitive behavioral therapy standpoint, we can get really focused on like, let's get better, right? Like let's improve Well, that's what symptoms. I was thinking about with the DSM. Cause I don't know if, I think the DSM allows for six months of, of bereavement. I think they've changed in DSM five, yeah, yeah. Um, but 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 that's a great point. Is like it used to is be it actually like now? I, I don't yeah I don't <laughs> remember so yeah what, it's like pathologized right like it's patho- yes if you it's, if you grieve more than six months from someone that you really love you're now pathological it's like right, no right no it's you know yeah so it's like there's there's such a fear of this emotion and yeah. and I think you know both from a third wave CBT perspective which of course we've we've borrowed lots from Zen Buddhism, it's this allowing of that experience, you know, and, and not allowing our fear of loss, like the fear that we're going to someday not have that person, Mm -hmm. like not allowing that to stop us from being present in our lives and connecting with other people. Yeah. Because that's something, I don't know, I'm thinking of a friend of mine that is, you know, just breaks my heart. I think that's a person I know who's experienced a lot of loss in their life. And this person has a very hard time um, allowing themselves to connect deeply with other people because they're so afraid of losing them. Mm -hmm. And so in the short term, right, it's like that feels safer. And yet this person then doesn't, doesn't uh, get to, to feel the depth of love that they could. Yeah. And yeah, you have to be able to be open and what are they, what's that saying? It's better to have love than, than to not have loved at all. But, but I think a lot of people say, in the, in the moment, like, no, because I, because what if, what if I lose them? Well, right? I know that's why my mom didn't get another dog. Right. Well, yeah. Right. <laughs> mom, if yeah, you're I listening. Mean, and, I, yeah. and I, and I challenged her and I said, well, is it better to like not have, have the, that, that the tragedy of losing a dog versus owning one and being able to experience a love for the X amount of years that you have them. And that's a values decision. It's a, well, it is. Well, and I think again, if we come back to just the intensity of the experience of grief, when we're going through it, you know, a lot of people can judge that as like, I, this isn't worth it. Yeah. Right. I mean, have you, I hear, I've heard that from people before. I mean, is that something that's that conversation? I mean, that's something obviously I also challenge, but like, I, I understand it. Like, they're yeah. like, I, I can't feel this way. Yeah. Well, uh, yes. I mean, it's, 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 it, it's fearful. And I'm reminded, so just to bring in some Eastern stuff yeah. to think about uh, a really good friend of mine, um, when he lost his mom and, and in a Baptist church, you know, so mm-hmm. sort of thinking mm-hmm. about it was really, really intense, you know, mm-hmm. the, the the ceremony, just lots of screaming mm-hmm. um, and, and, and non-judgment of the emotion. Right. Just like allowing what's just whatever yeah. came come and, yeah. and throw yourself on the floor and do whatever you need to do, you know, and, yeah. and mean and like having studied some of the Buddhist stuff, which is like, well, do it peacefully and calm and, and, and accept. And, you know, sometimes in some Buddhist traditions, depending on where they are in the world, they would have ceremonies and the ceremonies mm-hmm. might just put the body on top of a mountain and let the vultures come eat it because wow. then you're feeding in the cycle of life. Mm. And so there you are watching a loved one just be eaten by, wow. by birds. Like that's in wow. Tibet in some of the Tibetan mm. literature. That's amazing. You know, and, and, and we have teachings of reincarnation and, mm-hmm. and um, Buddhists often will do um, cremation, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. because they don't believe that their body is, is theirs. They believe that their body right. is just a vehicle and that it's just uh, borrowed for this life. Right. Right. And, well, you know. well, cause the, and, and, you know, of course that gets into, um, you know, like concept of like souls and, and, you know, and who we are, I, I think I, I want to, um, before we we're going to end here in a couple of moments, but there, there are two things I just want to add about that. I want to go back to what you're saying about like the, the sound, the screaming and the sounds yeah, that people yeah. were making, you know, there's something very primal about yeah. grief. Right. And, and I'm, 
reminded of two things I've read about animals. Yeah. Which really just like, oh, they hit me so hard when I think about it. The Don't first cry. is, yeah, I will probably. <laughs> <laughs> I probably will. So the first was I had read this beautiful article in the New York Times a while ago about this, um, about actually this man in New York who takes care of birds when mm-hmm. their owners pass because birds can live like 30, 40, 50 years. Yeah. And the and the birds grieve. They yeah. and they and they wail. Ugh. And they wail. And it's like, you know, and I was again, I always talk about like humans for some narcissistic, right? We think that grief is unique to us. Like, no, no. this is a, so that's one. And then the yeah. second is, and this is also just very beautiful, that elephants, you know, which are a matriarchal mm-hmm. society, they um they have funeral funerals yeah. for their dead. Yeah. And one thing that they do is they gather around the bones of the deceased elephant and they yeah. all touch the body. Isn't that amazing? Oh, it's like, and I think and so like the the point that I want to make is like grief we need grief because it can it keeps the connections to those that we love Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. that i often say to people like love and connection always has a has another side like an underbelly right like when those that we love are walking this earth the underbelly is fear right like we can't love somebody without feeling fear that we're not gonna that we're gonna lose them at some point that's right and then when right and then once they do pass and they you know whatever tradition you believe in even if even if you're an atheist right the then there's grief with the love but the love and connection doesn't isn't severed by death right yeah yeah so it it, it remains it remains yeah you know but i think that's a difficult concept for people to connect with because they're so afraid of the feeling yeah and it's about celebrate and that's why some people are going to think it's weird that i said celebratory of my aunt's life. And, and really it's about, and it's one of the things I say to a lot of people in my personal life is just celebrating the person's memories. And that's, and that works for me, but that could also be part of the positive toxicity and, you know, really trying to find, and, and I think the, the key here is just doing what works for you, identifying that there are these stages of grief, notice them, you know, label them. Uh, and then that you're going to like ebb and flow through all of them. And that is fluid in, in how you go through the process. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll end with um, something a friend of mine has told me that I believe it can't, comes from the book um, Through the Looking Glass, which oh, is yeah. this concept that she always says, I find it very helpful personally, that grief is like a brick that we carry with us. Mm-hmm. And at first it's very heavy. And over time it gets, you know, we get used to it, but it's with us always. And that brick that we carry with us is what connects us to, to those that we've loved and lost. This has been When East Meets West. I'm Dr. Nikki Rubin. And I'm Dr. Pete Economo. Be present, be brave. This has been When East Meets West. All material is based on opinion and educational training of Drs. Pete Economo and Nikki Rubin. Content is for informational and educational purposes only.